So I'm sure that's what he's going to talk about, or something like nothing like that. Nothing <laughs> like that. <laughs> Not at all. Well, but see, he's also a changeable person. He will he will change, turn on a dime. Are so you doing a cold reading? He, Mark is the <laughs> best cold reader. <laughs> he has a personality that likes to challenge, ladies and gentlemen. Shame. Thank you very much. All right. Oh yeah, that thing. Does he have it? I have the microphone. Oh, he has it. I am all mic'd up. Eyes up here. I'm all set to go. All right. Eyes up here. All right. So, Sherlock Holmes and Watson go camping. Baker Street, the Baker Street flat is getting painted. They have to get the hell out. So they decide they're going to hit the English countryside. Go camping. So they load up the camper van, drive out to the English countryside. It's starting to get dark by the time they get out there. So they pitch the tent. They go to sleep. 3 o'clock in the morning. Holmes wakes up Watson. Watson, Watson, wake up. What is it, Holmes? Watson, what do you see? Holmes, I see billions and billions of stars. Well, well. Well, Watson, what can you infer from that? Well, 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 if there are billions and billions of stars, there must be millions of billions of planets. And if there are millions of billions of planets, there must be thousands of billions of inhabitable planets. And if there are thousands of billions of inhabitable planets, there must be hundreds of billions of, of planets on which life evolves. And if life comes into being on hundreds of billions of planets, there must be billions of planets with intelligent life, which means right now there must be billions of planets with intelligent civilizations trying to contact us right now. And Holmes says, no, Watson, you idiot. It means somebody stole our tent. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see a show of hands? How many of you believe that intelligent life exists on other planets? Okay? I would say that's about 50% of you, give or take. Okay? Um, so this talk, I tried to create the most obtuse title I possibly could. Thank you very much. But what, but what I'm really talking about here is why do so many smart people believe in little green men? And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. This is my biggest pet peeve in the skeptical movement. I've asked a bunch of prominent skeptics and scientists to talk about this. They've all refused, so I'm doing the damn talk. OK? Um, and uh, in the end, I will come up with an ultimate answer to the question, are we alone? OK? So buckle up. It's going to be exciting, OK? Hey, you know what? We're staying to the end, right? Seatbelts. Right? Seatbelts on. All right. So, for the purpose of this talk, um, I'm going to be talking about LGMs, little green men. Uh, that's not a sexist term, because we all know that aliens uh, walk around naked and have no genitals, so they are sexless. Okay? So just work with me on that. How do you know they are men? Well, it's, it's just a, a generic term. Uh, it's not a sexist term. I'm just using the, the term LGM as a generic term for aliens on other planets, not to be confused with uh, with extra, extraterrestrials who are visiting Earth. We'll talk about that as kind of the UFO phenomenon, OK? Uh, you know what? I think we've gotten way too hung up on this whole gender thing already. <laughs> From now on, I will no longer call them LGMs. I will, I, I will not call them little green men. I'll just call them LGMs, and we'll leave it at that. OK, little good. LGBT, LGBT, yeah. LGBT transgender. Oh, I knew I would get in trouble for this. OK. <laughs> Now, it's worth saying that, s settle down, people. I'll turn, I'll turn this UFO around right now. Um, it's worth saying that they're both extraordinary claims and therefore justify scientific skeptical inquiry. OK? Um, you will see that I've had people tell me that uh, one of them is not uh, a, a claim that is worthy of scientific skepticism. So um, I asked you guys, you said uh, about 50% of you believe there's uh, uh, intelligent life on other planets. Well, space.com ran a, uh, a survey, about 130,000 people a couple years ago. But 90% of the people said, yep, we may not have found them yet, but uh, 
but, but they're out there. Okay? About 5% said they're science fiction, they don't exist, and 5% said, I don't know. So the public agrees with, with you guys generally. They kind of believe this. The press believes this stuff. So anytime anyone in any organization that smells of science says anything about extraterrestrials, they're all over it. So this ranges from uh, things like discovering water on Mars and saying that um, it boosts the hopes that there is, uh, that there is life on Mars. Um, now, water is, of course, a necessary but completely insufficient requirement for life. So um, saying that I found water on Mars also boosts my hopes of making tea on Mars. But that's, that's a, a different point. So it ranges from that, which is a pretty rational thing to say, all the way out to this alien megastructure story that happened uh, a couple of months ago. So I don't know if you guys saw this, but Kepler found something. Ke Kepler is a, a NASA mission trying to find exoplanets, planets that are orbiting other stars. And um, uh, they found something they didn't understand. And immediately, all over the press, must be an alien megastructure. So my favorite story about this was a scientist who was interviewed who said, you know what, it's probably not an alien megastructure, dot, dot, dot. But it's an alien megastructure. <laughs> and it's like, it's a bit of a leap of faith. So anyway, the press believes this stuff. The thing that drives me the craziest is a lot of prominent scientists and skeptics believe this stuff. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of them here, but it's a much longer list than this. So the first I'll point out is Bob Novella. If any of you listen to the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, uh, Bob Novella is a prominent host of that show, one of the, one of the famous Novella brothers on that show. Um, and he regularly claims the inevitability of alien life. Uh, Leonard back there can attest that I had a discussion with him where he pretty much called me an idiot for not believing that there's alien life out there. We had a discussion with him. Yeah. Um, uh, the next one I'll mention is Brian Dunning, who uh, does Skeptoid, who on one of his videos says, it's practically a mathematical and statistical certainty that life exists elsewhere. That's pretty definitive. Um, Seth Shostak from the SETI Institute. Now, the SETI Institute, the SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, you know, part of the reason for being is to talk about the fact that there's extraterrestrial life out there. So it's understandable that they would, they would make some extraordinary claims here. Uh, but he has a bet going that we will find alien, intelligent alien life within 20 years. Now, his bet is a cup of coffee. So I'm not quite sure how much he's really putting into that. But how long ago did he make that bet? Uh, I think it was two years ago. He actually said, uh, no, no, no. It was 25 years, three years ago, I think. So it's, uh, it's close. Well, anyway. He'll probably be dead by then. Uh, 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 maybe, maybe not. But I'm collecting all my damn cup of coffee. So. <laughs> The last one I'll point out is Andrew Fracknoy, who is uh, an astronomer out of Foothills College, a popular uh, science educator, who, um, who, when I asked him to do a talk on this topic, responded, I don't regard, regard SETI as a topic for skeptical discussion, which to me is the worst possible answer a scientist can give because it shuts down all discussion. It says this is off limits. And for science, there should really be nothing that's off limits. So I find this interesting because skeptics laugh at a lot of things that seem completely implausible. So I'm going to go through a few of those now. And we'll talk about some of the, some of the ideas behind why smart people would believe in little green men. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have mentioned I have a, I realize that I have a whole lot of of alien artifacts that people have given me over the last few years. So randomly, I'm going to be pulling those out of a bag and putting them out here, Excuse me. one at a time. Yeah? Well, you asked how many of us believe in intelligent life possibly existing anywhere in the universe. Outside of the Earth, is what Outside I asked. Of the Earth. Yep. And then you're making it sound as if we actually believe in literal little green men. Yeah, little green. So again, it's not men. <laughs> and they may not be little, and they may not be green. And they might be tiny. Exactly. And then what's intelligent? So that's, that's a different story. Hold on to that, okay. right? Sorry. Um, if I don't answer your question by the end, we can come back to that. But uh, uh, there's a question as to whether it's intelligent life or just life. And honestly, I think a lot of the concepts that I'm going to talk about pertain to both. It doesn't matter to me. Um, OK, so 
Um, a lot of skeptics talk about, um, uh, a lot of skeptics laugh at concepts that resemble a lot of this LGM theory. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this. So most skeptics laugh at ufology, this idea that extraterrestrials are visiting us. And actually, there's a lot of evidence of UFOs. The problem is it's all terrible, terrible evidence. And it's generally easily debunked. And I hate using the word debunk in a room full of skeptics, because generally skeptics don't like to debunk. We like to investigate. But this stuff is, is so bad, it's very clearly bunk. And I'll demonstrate what I mean. So that picture is one of the famous Billy Meyer photographs of UFOs. And I pulled this off a true believer ufologist's website, who puts it up there and says, OK, I'm a true believer. But this picture is crap. That's clearly not a UFO. That's clearly a crankshaft pulley. <laughs> and if you look at it closely, you can see where the, uh, the belt on the crankshaft was. And he actually shows a picture of a part exactly like this. And it looks just like that. So the true believers are debunking their own stuff. It's so bad. Now, this ranges from natural phenomenon. It could be people are seeing Venus. It could be people are seeing planes. There was a great talk at the Amazing Meeting a couple of years ago. There was, um, uh, this was one of the Sunday morning papers where um, uh, just an average guy had seen all these claims of people saying they'd seen a UFO. He went to the airport, got the logs of when planes were taking off, did the math to figure out where they were standing, where the plane would have been, and said, it's this flight. Basic, basic stuff. It's not brain surgery. These days, a lot of it is also um, computer graphics or Photoshop. That's pretty easy to debunk by people that know what they're doing. And of course, there's underwhelming physical evidence. Where are my alien implants? Where is my ray gun that couldn't possibly come from this planet? Where is my alien body? They should be there, but they aren't. So skeptics laugh at this stuff. Another thing that skeptics laugh at is cryptozoology. So cryptozoology is this idea of looking for legendary beings that exist somewhere. This could be Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. And again, there's a lot of evidence for this. And again, it's terrible, terrible evidence that is easily debunked. Very often, it's, it's uh, like the, the, the Patterson video. It's someone in an ape suit. Not that, not that hard to do. Uh, some, sometimes, like the, uh, the, lock, the famous Loch Ness Monster surgeon photo up there, um, uh, which has kind of been debunked as being a, a, a toy submarine with a little toy head on it. Um, uh, this stuff is generally not accepted by skeptics. Could you hang on to that for, for a few minutes? Um, so very often, this stuff is natural phenomenon. In the case of lake monsters, it's very often floating logs, or it's wildlife. Um, it's these kind of badly fake practical effects, like the ones I'm showing here. There's terrible methodology in this stuff. Anyone that's seen any of the cable shows around Bigfoot, the logic goes something like this. I'm in the woods. I heard a noise. Therefore, Bigfoot. <laughs> and again, there's underwhelming physical evidence. If, you, um, if there are big creatures walking around there, you'd expect to find corpses or bones or DNA evidence or scatological evidence, something. And then you get into all of the special pleading where, well, when they die, they become invisible. <laughs> or they turn into smoke. And, you know, and then, and then it, just, it, just, it just completely falls apart. So skeptics laugh at this, right? They laugh at it. So it's interesting that how is looking for ET not extraterrestrial cryptozoology? In many ways, it's similar. It's a little like saying, I'm looking for Nessie in Loch Ness, except it's a much, 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 much larger lock. OK? And it's not Nessie, it's, it's LGMs. Um, so this, this points out an interesting thing, right? So I can, I can do a search and make it look very sciencey by trying to measure a lot of things, putting things on a graph. But that's not necessarily science. 
This is what Harriet Hall likes to call tooth fairy science. So if I want to sit down and understand, uh, do, do a complete study on the tooth fairy, I can talk to people who have had experiences with the tooth fairy. Most of them, by the way, are under about five. <laughs> but I talk to the sum of people who have had experiences with the tooth fairy. And I measure the teeth. I weigh them. I, uh, I measure the diameter, the length. I record what time I put it under the pillow. I record how long they're there. I record how much money I get back. And then I have a lot of very good data talking about the tooth fairy. But let's not forget that that experiment in no way justifies that the tooth fairy even exists. You should be careful um, what you're measuring until you know you're trying to measure something that actually exists. So, um, so that, that's a persistent problem. But why don't skeptics generally laugh at little green men? Well, basically one of the reasons is there's no evidence for LGMs. It's all theory. In the case of cryptozoology or ufology, there's evidence, lots of it, and it's bad, so it's easy to pick apart. In the case of LGMs, there's no evidence, and it's tough to pick apart, no evidence. So there's this idea of, of technology optimism. I'm not going to go into this in gory detail, but if you talk to a lot of the people that believe in um, LGMs or um, transhumanism is a great example, where people think, well, it's a bright future if human beings can, can, um, uh, can live forever. Um, that, that's true. That's really good. There's nothing wrong with optimism. But um, technology optimism has consequences. If you put all of your, all of your goals in that basket, um, you're going to miss out on, um, on a lot of other things. So. Um, you're missing out on, on spending that time and money on researching what could be some, some, some real legitimate science as opposed to some things that you're just optimistic about. Um, and then there's the claim that the methodology that uh, uh, people that are looking for LGMs is solid science. So in some cases, it's tooth fairy science. And in some cases, there's this idea that if I put an equation behind it and I make it sound sciencey, that that must be good science. Which, of course, brings me to the very famous equation um, that surrounds LGMs, and that is the Drake equation. So this is Canadian <laughs> rapper Drake. And this is not the equation we're going to be talking about today. This is Frank Drake. And in 1961, he came up with a very nice framework for how to talk about intelligent extraterrestrial life and our chances to contact them. So um, he came up with this formula. I'm going to go through it in some detail. It looks very mathematical. It's not that complex to understand. So let's just take a minute and go through it, all right? So the first element here is the rate of star formation. The next one is the fraction of stars that have planets. The next one is the number of planets per star that could support life. The next one is the fraction of those that actually develop life. The next one is the fraction of those that develop intelligent life. Then the fraction of those that send signals. And then the lifetime of those civilizations. So let me start with one end of this. So starting on this side, those first three values I'm just going to concede are huge. Doesn't matter how huge. It's not even worth discussing. They're bigger than you can think of. They are Sagan big. Okay, they're really, really, really big. Multi-Sagan multi -Sagan big. Um, so it's worth pointing out that these two values, so the number of planets and the number of planets in the habitable zone, Earth, the somewhat Earth-like planets, um, if you look at the work that Kepler has done over the last couple of decades, it's stunning. We've learned so much great science about, about our universe and how our universe is composed. A couple of decades ago, we didn't have any information that there were, we didn't have any confirmation that there were planets circling other stars. Now we know about thousands of them. It's amazing, amazing science. So um, those first three are huge. The next one I want to talk about in a little more detail, and that's the, ch the 
um, this idea of um, the fraction that actually uh, uh, create life. So initiating life is this concept called abiogenesis, this idea of creating life from no life. And the biggest experiment that people cite when they talk about this is the Miller-Urey experiment that took place in, in the 50s. So really interesting concept and fascinating science, uh, a groundbreaking science. So the idea is they took some basic elements that were in place in the early Earth, put it in a closed system, add heat, add sparks of electricity to simulate lightning. What do they get out? Amino acids, okay? Some basic building blocks of, of life. The problem is, it's a promising result, but it's not life. And there's a lot of steps before you get to life. Now, since the Miller-Urey experiment, there have been a bunch of other great things that have been done. So we have a lot more information now about RNA, about ribosomes, about cellular structure, how those might have come about, about protocells, and about how cells would replicate. But these are all still baby steps. And they're all promising, but we still don't really understand the origins of life. So it's, wor it's worth noting that because a lot of people don't understand that this is not a solved problem yet. The interesting piece is there's great work being done on this and we may have an answer to this in our lifetimes, but we don't yet. It's also worth pointing out that evolution tells us how life proliferates once it starts, but evolution makes no claims about how life starts. And a lot of people don't realize that either. Okay, um, so let's get back to the Drake equation. So, huge, don't know. The next two, um, we only have the Earth to look at. And from what we know there, um, so the next one is, uh, what are the chances of life, of intelligent life evolving once life evolves? Um, on the Earth, we've had something like five billion different species, and of those, only one of them has risen to the level of intelligence. I'll get to you later, Leonard. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, okay, you're, you're making my job too easy now. Um, of those, as far as we know, only one, barring political candidates, only one of those species have gotten to the point where they could, in fact, send a signal. And of those, um, exactly 100% of those species have broadcast signals out into space, and that would be us. Um, is the Earth representative of other civilizations? Well, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. We have no idea of knowing. And then the last one is lifetime of, of intelligent civilizations. And again, we have no idea. We really have no idea. So what we end up with is huge times I don't know. So let's just take a second and do the mathematics of I don't know. OK? Um, Mark, you want to tell me why we have Abbott and Costello on here? Um, third base. Oh, third base. <laughs> right? OK. Uh, so let's do the mathematics of I don't know. OK. Huge times I don't know is not equal to huge. Now, most of the skeptics that say it's a mathematical inevitability uh, get this math wrong. Because the truth is, huge times I don't know is I don't know. OK? <laughs> We're on the same page there? Right. All right, good. All right, I want to talk about a few philosophical arguments that people, people make just to kind of wind things down. And the first is this argument from hubris. And it goes something like this. How special do you think you are that you somehow believe that human beings are the only intelligent life to ever evolve? Like, that's a lot of hubris to believe that. Well, the counter argument to this is, why does the universe give a damn about intelligence? <laughs> I mean, uh, the universe cares about intelligence. Like the universe, ca like the universe cares about creating a green pepper that looks like Sylvester Stallone. Sometimes weird shit happens. It happens once for no reason, and it's done. So this idea that the universe cares about creating intelligence, that there's some value in creating intelligence on the part of the universe. That's hubris. So you can look at hubris as in either way. The last philosophical argument I want to talk about this is the Fermi paradox, which is pretty fascinating and compelling. So 
The argument goes uh, like this. So there are billions of stars in the galaxy that are billions of years older than our sun. Some of those are going to have Earth-like planets. We know that from Kepler. Um, some might have developed intelligent life. Some might have developed interstellar travel. Our galaxy could be completely traversed in the space of about one to two million years. So we should have been visited by now. The question is, where the hell is everyone? They should have been here. They aren't here. Uh, the skeptics always laugh at the people that say we've been visited by UFOs, so that can't be the case. So. But what about the ones among us? What, what, about the <laughs> <laughs> possible. So, in fact, let me talk about some possible answers to the Fermi paradox. So, um, one is that we could be the first. Someone has to be first. Maybe it's us, and we get back into hubris. But wait, what? That we are the aliens? The, no, that we are the first intelligent life ever to develop. Right? So no one has come to visit us because we're first, right? So we got to go out and start visiting people. It's possible that the nature, it is the nature of intelligent life to destroy itself. That you get to a certain point in intelligent life and you blow yourself up. It's possible that it's in the nature of intelligent life to destroy all other intelligent life. So there may be intelligent life that's running around killing all the other intelligent life out there. And we just haven't seen them yet. So we need to be careful what we broadcast. Um, it's possible that intelligent civilizations are just too far apart in space-time. So by the time we find out about an intelligent civilization, we're already gone, or they are, when we broadcast to them. Um, it's possible that there is some kind of intergalactic prime directive. So they are contacting us, and so we're effectively in some kind of alien zoo. I can come up with all kinds of great science fiction on this stuff. Um, it's possible that we just aren't listening properly or that our estimates are just off. That some of the things in the Drake equation that we think are very likely to happen are not very likely to happen. But the fact is, most scientists and skeptics believe that we have not been visited. And so the Drake, uh, a Drake's conjecture is in fact a paradox. So let's, let me wrap up now with some logical seemingly rational thoughts. <laughs> so the first is that LGM is an extraordinary claim and as such justifies um, skeptical inquiry. It's, it's fair game. Um, I'll also say that there's nothing wrong with exploration or optimism. Those are important things. They aren't necessarily science. Um, they help science along and once you've found something through your optimism or your exploration, then you can actually start to measure it with science, and that gets interesting. But we shouldn't guide all of scientific inquiry with those alone. Um, also, it's worth noting science is yielding some amazing insights in our lifetime. Um, Kepler is finding exoplanets that are telling us a lot about the nature of the universe. Unbelievable science. And there's lots of great work going on on a, um, um, abiogenesis. So in our lifetimes, we may understand where life comes from. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. Sadly, we don't have that answer yet. So looking at the big question, are we alone? I think after looking at all of the evidence and the philosophical arguments, you must agree that there is only one rational answer, and that is I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> now that's not a very fulfilling answer. Um, yes, very fulfilling. No, pretty fulfilling. Depressing, but pretty fulfilling. I don't know is really what science and skepticism are all about. That's the beginning of a conversation. So if you come up to me at the end of this and you say, Jay, I really liked your, your talk. It's like, that's, that's nice. If you say, Jay, I really hated your talk, that's nice. If you say, Jay, I'm not quite sure what to make of your talk, that's the beginning of a conversation. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Oh.